Hey, Justin here. I wanted to throw a disclaimer up front with this episode. It's been in the can for a while, but we've all been varying degrees of busy and haven't really had the opportunity to get around to editing it and putting it out. Uh, we are just a few guys doing this for fun, so quite often life has to take precedent over um, editing the podcast and getting it out in a timely manner, so you will hear some references to things like Loki Season 2 not being finished yet and David Fincher's The Killer coming out soon and the texas rangers having just won the world series obviously this happened a while ago uh, and this is out of date a bit in those regards but just wanted to let you know we're aware of how old this episode feels and we're releasing it now so enjoy hey guys in this week's casually criterion episode we are going to review raging bull but before that we will be talking about loki season two so far uh, in News on the March. So join us! Hello and welcome to Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is... Mike, how are you doing today, sir? You raging or bullying... <laughs> what is bullying i don't know i just thought of it yeah. don't google it <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't, don't. yeah i don't i don't think oh, i'm definitely not raging and i don't think i'm bullying but i don't know what that is but it sounds dirty <laughs> you're right it does and if you combine the two together it's probably awful uh also with us is justin um <laughs> i'll like spare you from that last question but how does it feel that the Texas Rangers won the World Series? I mean, like that's the that's the important thing. They as of recording, it happened yesterday. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty pretty happy. Yeah, I'm pretty bored of it already. Uh, yeah, I, I have no are. memory of this. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I'm just yeah. I don't know. I don't think whatever you're talking about exists. Um, much like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. Okay. Well. I guess that's the beginning, the end of the beginning. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, anyway, if this is your first time listening, this is a Casually Criterion episode, which we do every other episode where we review a film from the Criterion collection that is voted on by our listeners via our Twitter page. Before we get into the main review, we'll be doing the usual news on the march where we talk about what we've been watching or what's going on. Uh, so if you haven't seen the movie, you could still listen for a bit, and then we will move into the casually criterion review for Raging Bull, spine number 1134. That's right. As Mike said, you can vote in our criterion polls on our Twitter slash X account. Uh, follow us there at Casual Cinecast. That's where we post the poll. It's the only place we post the poll, so that's where you need to follow us if you want to have a say. You can also uh, send us any questions to that account. You can also email us at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And, of course, if you haven't done so already, you like the show, give us a rating, give us a review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. Yeah, please and thank you. Okay. Yep. I say we go ahead and just move on unless Chris has any more uh, banter. Texas Rangers won the World Series, baby! All right. Yeah, all right. I'm editing that out. <laughs> oh, you're gonna edit this week now? Nope. <laughs> I'm just gonna take all your work and then re-upload it. Okay. <laughs> you on the mark. Okay, so all we have to talk about today uh, in News on the March is just Loki Season 2, and I don't think we're going to get too detailed other than general thoughts, because one, the season hasn't wrapped up, and also, uh, two, we haven't seen the same amount of episodes. So, um, <laughs> I guess let's go ahead and start with Justin, because sure. uh, you've seen the least amount of episodes, and True. I believe you were also a big fan of Loki season one or as big a fan of like a, an MCU thing as one could yeah. be. Sure. Yeah. Or it, it's the MCU thing that I've been the biggest fan of, I think, especially in the, the Disney plus like TV series. 
yeah. era. I don't, I don't think anything's really come close to touching it. I don't think that's a unique take either. But <laughs> no, but I don't know. I like it not. a lot more than most of the movies. Even I thought it was really fun. I I also just have a soft spot for time travel stuff, um, and that sort of sci-fi thing in general. So I was very, very, very into season one and couldn't wait for season two. And so far, I have watched two of the four episodes that have been out, which doesn't sound like something a person who is very excited would do. But yeah, sounds like you couldn't <laughs> wait indeed. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't really know exactly what happened. It just got away from me. Um, Good yeah. And well, then, I mean, you know what? It was the it was Halloween era time. So there's lots of scary movies being watched. Lots of sports games that I assume you were watching. <laughs> yeah, I did. I watched some sports games. Your and, sports games happening now. Yeah. I hear about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, I finally got around. And so far, I've, I've done two episodes. And um, I haven't quite got to the third one. I probably could have knocked out the third one before this episode. But I just have not been digging this season as much. I, I'm, I don't know if it's the hype that I had for the first one. Just this one's just seemed a little, a little less interesting, a little more convoluted like i don't i i feel on occasion like i've missed an episode like there were a couple times that i had to like you know pause the episode so i could see and make sure that i was watching episode two of season two <laughs> mm-hmm. um just i was a little confused um i just felt i felt i felt like i was missing out on something i was like there's i fell asleep or something during this episode um <laughs> at some point that, and didn't notice that's funny that you say that because i had the exact same reaction watching episode two like halfway through the episode i was like did i what have i missed and then it turns out nothing it's just yeah. so uh strange episode yeah. two yeah maybe the answer is to patiently wait till the season concludes and then it'll all make sense I could see them doing something like that, um, although that is would be a pretty risky move for a Marvel sort of thing, because um, they don't want to lose people. But anyways, um, I'm, I mean, I'm enjoying the new additions to the cast. Uh, Kihei Kwan um, being in there is fun, and the new security guard that they added, who's I only know from um, Blind Spotting. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, he's like. David Diggs's friend in that movie. Yeah. Dang. Okay. I, I did not recognize him at all. It took me a second to, to put it, but um, once I did, I couldn't unsee it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But um, but I, I'm enjoying like the, the new additions. It's just like it hasn't quite taken off. It hasn't quite hooked me um, with anything going on yet. And maybe that's just because by episode two they haven't really dove into like the chaos that's feels like it's coming at least with the way that episode two ends off. Um, but you guys who have seen more, um, I guess I'll go to Chris. Just, I don't know if there's more to be excited about and it gets, it picks up. Um, but I'm a little underwhelmed after episode two, but Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I think on uh, <clears throat> at the beginning with the first two episodes, uh, I, I, I'm not far different from you. Uh, at least as far as, episode two goes episode one i really loved and i think the thing that would keep me coming back even if it's like mediocre is owen wilson and um loki what's tom, tom hiddleston. hiddleston yeah yes uh, i was ready <laughs> <laughs> I, I had in just a second but uh anyways they like their banter about you know between each other and then uh actually adding um kihu kwan in there as well uh he may be the MVP, especially of the new, ad, you know, he just has this way of delivering lines uh, that's so, like, naive, but, like, in, in not a pandering way, if that makes sense. That's Anyways, just I, always been him, man. He has, yeah. like, a genuineness to the yeah, way he yeah, delivers lines that is yeah. just so, like, immediately disarming. He had it in Goonies. He had it in Temple of Doom. He still he had it in everything, everywhere. Yeah. Like, sure. But the he, dude's just likable. Yeah, he can deliver like the crappiest lines, and I'm like, brilliant, <laughs> you know, Oscar worthy, yeah, you know, like, uh, yeah. uh, because <laughs> you just, there's just this unique way, and maybe you're right, he has done that for a while, but it, in this format, it's just so unique and interesting. There's a lot of like gobbledygook, like Star Trek gobbledygook, you know, like, we've got to invert the phasers or whatever, you know, like, and you kind yeah. of yeah. don't necessarily, uh, 
Yeah, you can just yada yada like yeah. whatever. Skip through like I, yeah, it's whatever. It's it's they, as long as they know what's going on. I don't necessarily yeah. need to follow like the technicalities of yeah, how they say the TVA the or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, I. And I would say through four, uh, which is where I'm at, uh, it, it does get better from the second episode. Uh, I think three and four are really good. Uh, the ending of four especially is like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Um, so uh, there's also some unique acting choices that are made uh, in episodes three and four that will be interesting. Um, I, I don't know, the whole MCU stuff, like recently there's just like that Vanity Fair article that just came out about how the MCU is failing or something like that, but it's it's always failing until it's not, and then it's succeeding yeah. and ruining. It was failing else. before Infinity War too, yeah. and then yeah. so for about five years there, yeah. those kind of movies bought them some time. Yeah, I, so I don't know, but uh, Mike, what are you thinking? Uh, how do you feel about it? Uh, basically, I think the same as Chris. Uh, I I really enjoyed episode one. I thought it was very funny going back and forth with like the past and the future and conversations happening and, and like the way they played with time travel and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of fun gags. Episode two, I feel like skips around plot wise a little bit and does weird things with it uh, getting us introduced to certain characters. I don't know. It's just a strange episode. I, I'm with you there. But like Chris, I think episodes three and four um, are more interesting. You know, I think I I need to see where this goes before I determine whether or not it, they were good. <laughs> yeah, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. As a whole, but, it's good. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't bored by them, and I and I was entertained. So I'm just kind of waiting to see if season two can stick the landing. I think that's this key... is the first season two of a Marvel show we've gotten, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. I think so. Yeah. Unless you count that "what if" stuff, which I don't. Was what if? The, I does it have a second season? I think. I don't think I don't it know. Has I never yet. watched it. If they did, but I, I remember coming. talking about it. <laughs> I think it's coming. I don't know if it's out yet. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's out yet. I think this is the first. But yeah, I think you're right about sticking the landing because uh, I think well, and one of the things Justin always says. Uh, or that sticks with me that Justin said, but I'm sure other people have said it before, but like, it's about the swings. And I feel like, uh, um, especially in episodes three and four, there are some big swings that are taken now, Mm -hmm. whether it, you know, they hit a home run or not to, I don't know yet. Uh, but I do respect them for taking the swings. A lot of this, uh, series is directed by my two favorite guys, Benson and Moorhead. Um, I think they directed almost all of them except for uh two maybe uh, i believe but yeah so uh and i think there is some i I do like the work behind the camera like there's some long takes that are are interesting and and good i think um so uh between the banter and the stuff behind the camera i think it's worthwhile i don't know we'll see how it lands and we'll see how like i feel about the yada yadding of like the you know technical Techno babble, but so far, I, I I don't know. I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I I find myself wanting more of the swings, or like missing those swings. Whereas, like, I think the first season because it was so different and doing something so different with Loki, like it felt like a big swing from the word go. You know, sure. Once you just learn about the TVA and and variants and all that stuff, and and like basically the first episode. <laughs> And we don't quite have that. And I feel like we haven't hit that point yet. So I think those are what will will um, hook me in more, you know, than what I'm feeling so far. Yeah, it'll like be interesting to see where you We've been catching up and kind of like resolving and setting up stuff for that sort of thing to happen. Like getting us from the end of season one to somewhere for swings to happen. At least that you guys probably know. I, I'm like the guy sitting here talking and you guys just know. And you're like, yeah, shut up. Just keep watching. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's stuff's happened there's momentum yeah i'll at least give it that there's momentum that i feel is honestly missing from a lot of mcu shows like i don't know i liked wandavision i liked loki season one the rest of them have all been okay to bad (laughs) right yeah you know uh in my opinion and with moments of goodness like i think there's moments of miss marvel that are great you know yeah I think yeah. there's a couple moments in Falcon and Winter Soldier that I really liked. Yeah. Uh, you know, so She-Hulk has some good stuff. Yeah. It's probably the best 
That's true. Yeah, I kind of forgot about She Hulk. I, I like She Hulk. Uh, I put those in with the first three, even though yeah. that one has some really bad stuff in it too, like bad CGI, <laughs> bad special effects. Yeah. But that's probably like Marvel the Studios' fault more than yeah. anything, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. It also feels like its own thing. Like yes, that was more I was so about to say than that. The, the rest, but the rest feel like they really lean on being, you know, in sort of MCU. branches of the MCU. Yeah. yeah. She well, the rest of them are kind of like long movies, fine. except for Wandavision. Yeah. Like they don't feel like. Like they're structured like TV shows usually are, right? And like She Hulk, I think, was successful in that way because it is very much designed to be like a like short little like little comics, you know? Yeah, okay. Which I think, I think great. Uh, the M- Disney and MCU, or however you look at it, just they didn't they kind of jumped in head first and, and didn't think about how they were going to do the TV shows. Uh, well, I think I think it's the same boat that Star Wars was in, uh, according to like that recent article, right? Which is that like they just started demanding content. Yeah. So like things that were kind of half baked, as long as there was an idea on the board, it was getting made. You know. Right. Because yeah. they, Disney Plus needed to fill up its roster of or whatever you call it, its, it's slate, whatever you know. It yeah. wanted it wanted to have content to compete Catalog. with, like yeah. So, I think most of the TV sh- or the TV shows thus far, except for the ones maybe we've mentioned, Loki and WandaVision and She-Hulk, could have been a two-hour movie as opposed to like six hours. Like I think, yeah, it would have uh, been better as a result. <laughs> yeah, um, like what was the uh, Jeremy Renner thing? Uh, Hawkeye show. I liked Hawkeye. Yeah, I liked it too, but I think it would have been better as a movie. Mm-hmm. But anyways, but yeah. that's neither here nor there. Loki is uh, season two. I I like. I think you should go. Should watch it. Um, yeah, I will. Yeah. I've, this is this has kind of helped reinvigorate me to to go to season or episode three. I mean, because um, yeah. because episode two just kind of left me flat, so I was not motivated. But now I am. Yeah, Thanks I was worried guys. after two as well. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> no, I was I like, don't what's think wrong so. with me? Yeah, no, I uh, I definitely feel it as well. So yeah, tonight I think the the new episode comes out, right? Is it Thursday evenings? Mhm. Yeah. Still still digging that Disney's doing the Thursday evenings or I think Ahsoka was Tuesday evenings, but I'm enjoying instead the of, evenings thing. Instead of the midnight release, that is definitely yeah. uh, an upgrade. Because midnight, midnight on the is west like coast three where basically <laughs> that means like 2 a.m. here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm basically happy as long as um they stick with the weekly release sort of thing. That's been my favorite development. Instead of this. dumping it all at once like Netflix. Yeah. Yep. Anyways. Yep, yep. Anything else on uh, Loki? Uh, no, I think I'm done. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll catch up, as always, whenever the season wraps up. It'll be interesting yeah. to see what you think, Justin. But Yeah. And how it lands. But I have the most to go. It's true. The most to experience between now and then. But yeah. Yeah. I think there will be decisions made in episode three that determine how much you enjoy episode three and four. And I'm interested <laughs> to see if if you go on that journey or not. Yeah. Okay. I'll text you and let you know. Okay. You have my information. I do. Didn't. Yeah. Unless you want to give it out uh, here on record just so it's always around and archived. No. And anybody can. No, probably not. I think I'll remember. I've had the same one for many years. Yes, you have. I remember your actual phone number. Do you know that? Uh. It's a pretty easy number to memorize, I think. What is it? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say, but I, you're, <laughs> I think you have like other than my wife's phone number because I have to enter it on all kinds of like information and stuff. Right? Uh-huh. Other than that, you might be the only like cell phone number that I know of anybody. Just we've had the same one for so long and had it since I had to know numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, like as long as I've known you, that number's been in my name. Basically. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make things easy on you. You know, I know you have a lot going on. Yeah, this is riveting. This is a whole yeah. new. Yeah. new what's this is a going casual on? phone number podcast. Which phone yeah. numbers do we remember? Anybody else got any cool ones? My uh, home. Phone I remember number. my home phone number from uh, whenever I was a little kid. That is no longer my home phone number. I don't know who has it. I haven't called it, but yeah, that's what we should do on air: is call our home phone numbers that we remember. <laughs> Yeah, and just see, what, just see who podcast. answers, yeah. yeah, and let them know what we're what what's, what we're doing. Yeah, I bet you when we call them, they'd be uh, raging bulls about it. All right, we should move on. <laughs> this is painful for me, even. Okay.
this whole well, interaction. T- t- take us there. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry right, I start, so, steered us there. <laughs> yeah, our casually criterion review for Raging Bull uh, begins now. The Bronx Bull, the Raging Bull. Let's hear for the great Jake LaMotta, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm the best. And I can take him more than anybody. You're dead. You're married. Leave the young girls for me. There's no way I'm going down. I don't go down for nobody. Listen, man. Why does he have to make it so hard on himself? If you beat Trigger Ray, you'll get a shot at the title. You feel that way? There's no one else around who wants to fight me. They're all afraid. There's a lot of bad things, Joey. Maybe it's coming back to me. All right, so as always with our Criterion films, we will not be doing a spoiler-free section up front like we do for our newer films. These films have typically been out at least a few years or more. This one's been out, uh, I'd say, on the more side of those. <laughs> so we are going to jump straight into talking about the, the film spoilers and also consider this your spoiler warning. If you have not seen Raging Bull, I would pause the podcast now, go watch the movie, come back, and finish listening. All right, so Raging Bull was directed by Martin Scorsese. It stars Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Kathy Moriarty. Uh, The IMDb synopsis says, The life of boxer Jake LaMotta, whose violence and temper that led him to the top in the ring destroyed his life outside of it. (laughs) Beautiful inflection. Yeah. Well, the sentence went places I didn't expect. (laughs) You know, you're quick on your feet, like a boxer. Yep. yep. You have to be, you know. That's what I learned last night watching this movie. <laughs> it was the central theme, right? Got to be quick on your feet if you want to make it to the top. That's true. You got <laughs> to be movie to inflect. Did we then... just discuss the movie moving on to the end of the episode? <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, okay. So who wants to kick us off? Whose movie was this? Was it... Justin. Justin. It was yeah, it was mine. Okay. It's my pick. So as is tradition, uh you should give us your thoughts. Okay, sure. I'll say firstly, this was only my second time seeing the movie and I didn't remember a ton about it other than like some visual stuff and some shots and the one scene where he asked Joe Pesci if he fucked his wife. <laughs> because <laughs> someone auditions with that scene in uh Christopher Guest waiting for Guffman. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> so I just that scene's kind of like burned into my brain <laughs> from that. Um, but I, I chose it because um, I recently got the 4K version from Criterion. So I, I really wanted to watch it and watch one of like my 4K Criterions finally. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like my main reason. Um, but I, I always remember liking the movie. It's it's never been one of like my top Scorsese or one that I've felt compelled to go back to too much. Um, and it's not because I, it's a, it's like a lesser movie or I dislike it. It's just like, it just doesn't have that rewatchability to me <laughs> as like Goodfellas and Casino and um, Hugo <laughs> have. Um, <laughs> Hugo. Yeah. I, I have a soft spot for Hugo. Um, yeah. Hugo's great. But it's obviously it's it's really well made. I think it's probably uh, in the sort of like masterpiece category. I love the cinematography is also obviously really great, especially the stuff like in the boxing ring. There's a lot of really cool stuff done and a lot of really cool um, editing in this that and I didn't quite remember how wild it gets with the editing where, you know, sometimes it's. Sometimes it's slow mo, like focusing on the the gruesome aspect of it, and sort of making it like hyper grotesque. And then sometimes mm-hmm. we're just getting still images of fights. Mm-hmm. And I th- I think what I found myself thinking about and wanting to like go back on my next viewing is, is maybe to dissect what why we're doing certain editing choices for certain matches um, and not others. I found that really interesting this time. Just to, like I, I really wanted to dissect the editing. I didn't have the chance to do that because it was like my first time to see it in over ten years. So it was really like a close to a brand new watch for me, right? Um, but obviously the writing's great. All the performances are great. 
I think it's just a movie that doesn't quite speak to me on a level, like a personal level where I get really hyped about it, but I recognize how well made it is and how well written and well acted and everything across the board is probably perfect about it. I don't know if I have a complaint about the movie. It's just, just maybe not like quite the movie that's going to speak to me and make me get over the moon about how much I love it. And, you know, tell all my friends they got to watch it or something if they've never seen it, that sort of thing. So that's where I'm at. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, uh, this is also my second time seeing this movie. The first time was many, many years ago. I don't even remember the year, uh, but I remember after I watched it, I bought the special edition DVD uh, at a Best Buy sale. So (laughs) it was in the DVD days and more specifically the era of DVD days where I was buying a lot of movies with no regard to the future me that would eventually have to lug all them around every time I move. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. um anyways i was excited to watch it again i was not upset that it won the scorsese themed poll that we put out for this episode sure uh because there was no losing in that poll in my opinion having i think seen all of them that were uh put out there i enjoy this movie a lot i think i agree with justin though it is not like one of my top Scorsese movies I would say it's maybe even like bottom third Scorsese but not because I don't like it a lot (laughs) you know yeah uh no I would say comfortably mid Scorsese you know I don't know you know like they're all like there's no losing there yeah it's got a lot of good stuff (laughs) in the middle of like a bunch of generally really good stuff that's not a bad place to be sure um, so I guess I would say, I think it's a, it's a great, like classic movie, but it's interesting before I had seen this movie, I'd always like heard about it through the lens of it being like a classic sports movie. Yeah. Uh, which to me is crazy because <laughs> it's entirely a character study about like one man and not even a particularly likable or cool man either. Um, but maybe that's why I like it more than I always thought I would, because I don't know. I kind of like character studies about flawed people. Right. (laughs) And I think Scorsese does too. (laughs) Because whenever I was watching this movie, I was thinking like, God, he really just likes to focus on like the really flawed self-destructive people Mm that just, (laughs) you can see them making bad decisions in real time. And and they don't seem to be particularly introspective. I think Jake LaMotta has a lot in common with other Scorsese protagonists in that way. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, yeah, good movie. Very innovative uh, at the same for the time, you know, 1980, while at the same time trying to make you feel like you're in the 40s. You know, it feels modern and it feels old at the same time. And I think that's really interesting. Uh if I have to say anything negative about the movie, um, this is hardly original or new, but I don't think the nose holds up. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, it, you know, I think prosthetics came a long way since 1980. I don't know. It's not the best looking, not the best looking nose, in my opinion. I think it looks better as the character gets older. He grows yeah. into the nose. Yeah, he grows yeah, into the he, nose. But he gets... When he's a younger man, it's fucking goofy looking and doesn't look <laughs> yeah as good. he gains weight and <laughs> yeah the rest of it kind of matches the nose <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so anyway th- that's where i'll leave it now uh solid movie i think after a second viewing still not in the upper tier of scorsese movies but i enjoyed it and there was a lot that i didn't remember uh i, d- I especially did not remember the the did you fuck my wife scene that was <laughs> I don't know. That's funny that you remembered that from Waiting for Guffman. But anyway. Yeah. I've seen Waiting for Guffman a lot more than Raging Bull. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have. Uh, all right, Chris, what do you think of Raging Bull? Yeah, I, I like what you guys had to say about it. Um, 
Thank you. (laughs) And that's that. No, I I think I would say this isn't rewatchable because the characters aren't likable. (laughs) You know, like, uh, I don't, they're toxic. (laughs) Uh, I mean, they're toxic in Goodfellas too, but that movie is a blast. There's a little bit more, um, there's the fun section. <laughs> yeah, there's this the fun section that. before everything goes down. Um, yeah. I mean, I think so. It's interesting because the other thing I would say is like Paul Schrader and Martin Scorsese, they kind of have they have a type of guy that they like talking about through their films. You know, like Paul Schrader is like main protagonists are always journaling in their bedroom, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, writing their manifesto or whatever. Right. And I think Martin Scorsese also. Uh, has a type. I mean, I think Leonardo DiCaprio in Killers of the Flower Moon is a Jake LaMotta type. You yep. know, like he, I was thinking dumb. about that a lot. Yeah, uh, he like there's a a moment where he's like, I, I need money f- so I, I don't have to go to jail, and he breaks up his uh, title belt, and then the guy's like, you know, <laughs> your title belt would have been worth a lot more <laughs> with the jewels in it. You know, like he's just they're just kind of dumb and mm-hmm. and toxic and destroy themselves. Uh, through their own like ignorance of themselves and their or, own lack of introspection, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so I think I think that that's why that this isn't super re- like to revisitable. You know, like uh, to go back to. Um, I think. The boxing scenes have a kinetic energy like the Copa Copana in Goodfellas that, you know, but it's just starting, you know, like uh, there is a kinetic energy to those boxing scenes. It's it's really fun, uh, even though they're like beating the shit out of each other, you know, like but as blood sprays from their faces and stuff like that, there's, <laughs> there's an interesting thing, it's interesting things going on during those sequences. Uh as opposed to the rest of, I mean, not that the rest of the movie's bad, but like they're just It's, it's pretty just straightforward. Jake. I don't think we get much stylized at anything in the rest of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Except for it's black and white, you know, like uh, that would be the but yes. Sure. Um But yeah, so I, I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I, I can understand why you I, I've, I've, this is my second time to watch it too and I felt th- the same way I was like well why haven't I come back to this you know like uh, why don't I feel like I, like I've watched Goodfellas a couple of times because you know I don't really go back to very often but like Silence I wouldn't go back to <laughs> that quickly you know like um, I've been wanting to revisit Silence because I was so deflated at the third act of Silence after what everything preceded it I thought had been like extraordinary I thought it was so good yeah. And then I just I left. And I think it's just Martin Scorsese is like, a, a, you know, he's like very open about his Christianity and he's very proud of it and he wants to explore it. So I don't think he arrived at the, the thesis I was going for in my brain. <laughs> sure. It'd be interesting to if we could work out a way to do an episode on that. I think that that would be an interesting one. I, I wouldn't mind going back, but it's. But I'm not necessarily going to go back on my own, if that makes sense. Sure. Anyways, uh, uh, yeah, I I really like this movie. I, it's interesting. Uh, there's the argument, and I'm, this isn't new either, but like Thelma Shoemaker um, editing, like is Martin Scorsese what he is without her? Uh, I don't know that he is because the editing is in all of his movies it is really flashy until just recently uh, where he's it's less flashy. Um, it's still, still pretty flashy from time to time. Yeah, but not as not like Goodfellas or uh, um, even Raging yeah. Bull. Yeah, so. I think there was some editing flash in Killers of the Flower Moon. But sure, sure. I, I yeah. take your point at least compared yeah, yeah. to like this and Goodfellas. And yeah, where that's like whatnot. kind of the the main. Yeah, when draw you're comparing to it to Goodfellas, scene. that movie's yeah. got a an energy all its own. And I wonder though, do you think if present day Scorsese made goodfellas do you think it would be how long is that movie 220 goodfellas something, something like that yeah. i don't know that seems Keep a lot longer than i thought <laughs> it's goodfellas is like i wonder now though if like this era scorsese would there be like a three and a half hour goodfellas i i think so i think it's interesting because i think he has so he made like mean streets he's irishman kind of caps off uh, his like 
mafia. I wouldn't even say trilogy because Casino's in there. But like, because it's an introspection. It's it's about a mafioso looking back on his life. You know, like uh, similar to like Martin Scorsese himself has grown through the ages and looks back on his own work and sees what he's done. I, I think that's what's interesting about stuff like The Irishman. Well, but, well just to tie this back to actual Raging Bull. So, and we talked about how Jake LaMotta reminds us a lot of um, Ernest Burkhart from Killers of the Flower Moon. But I think it also reminds me of, I don't remember the character's name, but uh, Robert De Niro from The Irishman as well. Yeah. This character that seems to uh, push everything good out of their life and make the wrong choice when it matters and then kind of live with that choice. But you don't and you see that they're unhappy. But I don't know with any of these protagonists that I ever get to the point to where I feel like they they look inward and they think to themselves, I went wrong. (laughs) I deserve right. this, right? <laughs> I just don't know that a lot of his protagonists are capable of such a thing. Jake LaMotta yeah. has that moment in, when he gets put in like the solitary confinement in prison where he's like, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Why, but I why don't think I... he learned anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's easy to feel upset with yourself when you're caught <laughs> and like yeah. very clearly like being punished and you you're i think it's that's more of a i mean similar to ernest burkhart right it's just more of a oh i don't want the i don't want to get my come up it's so now i feel i know i'm upset yeah how do (laughs) i not and i'm upset because i got caught yeah and that makes sense uh he just he's the moment where he cries after the dive yeah throwing the match yeah which he doesn't even do it very well. I mean, that's kind of the the whole thing. He's just dumb, you know. Like <laughs> uh, he, yeah. he doesn't throw the match in a way that covers it up, you know, and he gets yeah. banned. Yeah, well, I I do find that interesting. Like he, he's got to do the dive, but he is um, determined to, to never fall. fall. Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. Even and in real is matches. that better? If you're gonna fall, is it better to let everyone know that that's what you're doing? <laughs> Well, maybe, but not in, (laughs) I don't know, not in this scenario. I think, I mean, he wasn't really given an option. He like, or at least the way the movie presents it. Well, what I'm saying is like, he could at least sell it like he actually got beat. Instead, he sells it like, I'm not going to try. This fight is entirely a sham. You know what I mean? Like he's standing there letting the guy win and making it obvious to everyone that he is supposed to be throwing the fight i think right yeah yeah that's why it gets banned (laughs) and that seems self-destructive in and of itself around his reputation as a boxer as a sport uh, a sportsman you know uh it just seems like a bad idea to do that yeah i think it's i i I see it as less planned out than that because i think he goes in ready to you know put on a match and then lose but when he throws that first punch he nearly knocks the guy out yeah. And has to like hold him up <laughs> against yeah. the ropes. And he's like, I think there's this moment that clicks for him that's like, I could beat this guy so easily. And I, they're I making can't do me anything. throw the, they're making me throw the fight. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't even pretend to fight this guy because he's so weak. Because my one punch almost knocked him out. And I think he says something similar after. Like, what am I supposed to do yeah, after one I'm, punch? I know that was his reasoning when he was talking to Joe Pesci, but I don't know. Well, I think it's it's like in the moment he has to change plans because yeah, because he can't actually pretend to fight this guy. Because okay, so it's not that he's self destructive; it's that he's stupid and not able to <laughs> to, to pull like, off the yeah yeah like yeah. he's not able to pivot yeah. in the moment and think of something. Right, maybe maybe a mixture. So I think it's it's also that like, well, this is clearly I'm clearly could beat this guy. Nobody's gonna buy this. I'm just gonna actually let it be obvious or I'm not, I, I don't know, do but, anything. but in that obviousness that he's going for, it seems so self-destructive. Cause like, yeah. I don't know. It feels like that would destroy your reputation as like a, like, how do you believe anything at that point? Unless the guy just, you know, like, how do you believe that even if he wins, if he, if he will lose on, per- you know what I mean? So yeah. yeah, that's what I mean when I say self-destructive, it, uh, one of many <laughs> self-destructive things this guy does throughout the course of the movie and it seems like after a certain point, that's all he does is just make bad decisions. 
Yeah. And I'm trying to think, but most of his bad decisions and self-destructive stuff seems to pretty much exclusively stem from the sort of like toxic masculinity and insecurity. Mm hmm. Like yeah, masculine insecurity, insecurity for sure. Um, I, I guess I kind of view those as the same. <laughs> I feel sure. like toxic masculinity, I guess, is a symptom of insecurity versus like, yeah, its own thing. Um, but yeah, that that masculine insecurity, just everything he does is constantly. I'm just like, man, just quit being so paranoid. <laughs> yeah. Like when he when he goes home and he wakes his wife up, and it just to like just kind of interrogate her and question her about <laughs> other people and yeah. other guys. And like, why or I think it was, wasn't like, why'd you say that about that? That guy, why'd you say that guy was good looking? The yeah. boxer. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the basis of the relationship. They don't, <laughs> they don't have any other relationship other than him interrogating her and, and w like watching her like a hawk, you know? <laughs> Uh, maybe at some point they were romantically loving to to each other, but we I certainly didn't recognize that in this movie. Well, um, I well, think at the beginning there was at least some passion. Yeah, yeah. There's a new passion, but he's he's the same way with his wife that he his original wife at the beginning of the movie. He's the same like yeah. like overbearing, overprotective, doesn't want her to go out, and like paranoid that she's out cheating on him. And he even when we start the movie he pretty much can't stand her. <laughs> they yeah. can't stand each other. Right. And he's still like protective. So I think it's just this dude's not meant to be married. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah, insecurity, this sort of masculine dominance and sort of thing of like, it's, it's okay if I do it, but don't you even say that someone else is good looking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't even let me think that you're thinking it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> Such a, I don't know that. I mean, I'm sure that that still exists. Oh yeah. But, oh, but... I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there, you know, just like that right now. If but uh, yeah, it seems, it seems like a more way... prominent thing at the time, mm. though. Sure. But maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. I, I think. I, I think. I think that it's just as strong now. It's just there's less it's presented in a different way. You know, like you could slap your wife around and not get in trouble <laughs> as much. Now it's, I don't know, more yeah. emotional, but like if, if you ever find yourself in that spot where you're like, man, I don't know if I trust her, just leave, you know, like uh, <laughs> it's, it's not worth it for either one of you. Uh, even if she's not cheating, but if you don't trust her, you need to go to therapy so that you can learn how to trust again and move on, you know? Yeah. That's what Jake LaMotta needed, just a little needed therapy. A lot of therapy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would have been very receptive to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. In fact, I think we could cure a lot of Scorsese's characters with some therapy. So, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. uh, This is a Betterment ad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> better help. Wow, that's, man, we need better to get help, some, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> some advertisements on here. That's my pitch. Yeah. <laughs> we just do we review Scorsese movies and talk about how the characters could use better help. Um, <laughs> we talked to Mike. You said something about the movie feels like modern and the like period piece at the same time. Did did you mean modern for the time that it was made, or yeah, how do modern you feel for about... yeah the, for the respective year that it came out in? Uh, yeah, how do you feel it holds up now? Like I, I actually think it still feels pretty modern, particularly the boxing sequences. Mm -hmm. Um. I think the the things where I could see where it like might not, um, I mean, you you called out the prosthetic already, but I and I don't know how I feel about the um the sort of like homophobia of the characters. It feels natural to the character versus like something the movie's doing to be amusing to me. But I don't know how yeah what. You... Oh, for like a cheap joke, like the movie's telling it for a cheap joke. Yeah, like I don't feel that that's what's happening. No, I think it's coming from a character place. That's something the characters would say, especially yeah. in that time. Yeah, but uh, uh, other than that, um, or including that, everyone, how do you guys feel about how the movie holds up? Well, I think dialogue-wise, it holds up quite well. But I think that's the case every time you have like one of these Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro scenes. 
<laughs> you know, it's the same as in Goodfellas. It just kind of feels like there's this energy to it, right? Where mm-hmm. it feels like it's ad libbed, but you know it's not. It feels like there's a lot of natural. Yeah, yeah, it feels very natural. It feels like they they've got chemistry. The way they bounce off each other feels just so like two people who know each other very well talking. And yeah, I I just feel very drawn to it. And so I remember thinking that the first time I saw this too, because whenever I I don't know, first watched it, I was in my early 20s. I was going back with the intention of watching not even a Scorsese movie at that point. I think I was just watching old movies that I needed to see, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, I finally watched Raging Bull and I was remember being like, I don't know what this is about. I think it's a sports movie. And I remember very clearly, like whenever Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro are sitting at a table talking, and I looked at the, you know, the thing and I was like, man, we're like 30 minutes into this movie. I think this is a lot more like this than I thought it was going to be. It just feels like just very, very alive. It it pops when those two are on screen. And I think that's always been the case. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I feel like Joe Pesci kind of gets undersung in this movie quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think in general, he's a pretty great actor, but I think he like went on to do things like gone fishing or uh man i liked that movie when i was a kid yeah i mean i don't dislike it but or lethal weapon like where he's kind of he uses that same persona but as a joke you yeah know, um home alone as a, home alone yeah that's another i always forget that he's in home alone but really yeah yeah that's, a, I don't that's know. one of the things i think of when i think of joe pesci i think of home alone goodfellas casino <laughs> and, and gone fishing and gone fishing. And, and gone fishing that's what I was. That's my point. Is I don't think of Raging Bull when I think of Joe Pesci, and I think that's a shame. And I think, and, and I don't know if I'm alone in that. I mean, do you guys think when you think of Joe Pesci, the great Joe Pesci performances that stand out to you, is Raging Bull in the top three or four? It should be. Uh, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's I don't not, know. That... I, I remember him again because of Waiting for Guffman <laughs> and just picturing. <laughs> it. I know he's the brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Um, but like I don't think of the scene where he beats the guy up in the club, uh, you know, and like smashes him in the taxi uh, cab door like I yeah. do for the other scenes in, in like Goodfellas, like the famous like like pen neck stab scene. Sure. You know, there's like those moments of his like exploding anger that always come up first, whereas like. That scene kind of belongs in that same sort of canon, but I don't ever really hear it talked about, and I don't ever think about it. I probably will now. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, Joe Pesci delivers a great performance here, and I think... Absolutely. I think he's my favorite part of the movie. Yeah. But, Uh, I mean, De Niro's doing pretty great work. I think it's easy to, to not give credit to De Niro because we're used to him being great. Like maybe not so much in the last like twenty years, but that's not his fault. I think he's, you know, I think the the great the roles are few and far between now. But I don't know. I, I think he's doing really great work here, even even for De Niro. You know, sure. I yeah. I think that this was a project that De Niro brought to Scorsese too. So yeah, this same is, with the Irishman. Yeah. Um, this is a thing that he wanted to do. So there's a passion, but I think you're right. Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro together, they elevate each other quite a bit. Um, and, and that's mm-hmm. kind of mainly what this movie is, you know, until the the second, like the or last third of it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Well, the scene where he sees him at the end of the movie for the first time in however many years is pretty great. Yeah. yeah. Like them playing off each other. Like, Without him saying anything, like him just him like holding him and just trying to be affectionate, <laughs> kissing his face <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. And the way so that Joe Pesci, yeah, Joe Pesci just kind of freezes up. He's just like, I'm gonna let this happen, but I, hopefully it'll be over pretty quick. You know? <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's like, I'll call you. And he's like, Yeah, yeah I'll call you. I was like, Sure. You have to give him your number. It's not like Mike's number where everybody remembers it. Yeah, true. I Maybe think he, he never changed, changed it. it. It's easier to look people's number up in those days, though. That's, that may be true in the phone book. Uh, yeah. I, I think to swing it back to the modern thing, I was thinking about it. But I think 
the reason this still feels somewhat modern is because there are a lot of things that are still in our movies, like the editing, for instance, you know, uh, I think this kind of sets the table for a lot of things. Um, I know, like, I thought of Requiem for a Dream with some of the editing, like the light bulb editing, like the really quick shots of the... the Yeah. When they're getting the pictures taken, those, like, I don't know what you call them, but, uh, but those just rapid the, editing... Like, photo flashes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, especially when they're by the pool, there's, like, this sequence where, like, they take a picture, you see the camera, you, you just several different flashes of stuff. So, I don't know. I think yeah. that there is a lot of stuff that's come from this movie. This is, like, the grandpa of a bunch of movies, and so it feels like we've seen a lot of it uh, in other movies, and so it still feels a little modern. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, I think that... I guess the ending, I remember the first time I watched this movie, uh, I was surprised because I had seen Boogie Nights a number of times and um, <laughs> I was like, oh, this is where he got the uh, the ending. And I guess speaking of being the grandfather yeah. or, or father of of movies. but Yeah, um, P.T. Anderson talks about that in uh, the commentary for Boogie Nights. Mm-hmm. Which Just is a great commentary, by the way. It is. One of the most entertaining commentaries I've ever watched multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> that and the, the Edgar Wright Hot Fuzz I remember watching together <laughs> maybe more than once. You know, I'm looking at the IMDb trivia, and the top trivia says that when the real Jake LaMotta saw the movie, he said it made him break down in tears and realize for the first time what a terrible person he had been. <laughs> uh, he asked the real Vicky LaMotta, was I really like that? And she replied, you were worse. <laughs> so I don't know where that came from or if that's true or not, but I like to I think know. it is. Yeah. Let's let the urban legend exist. Yeah. Uh, I'm down for that. But um, I mean, I, I, do you have any thoughts of like basically the section where he's past it and um, overweight and he's running his nightclub where he just does terrible stand up, which De Niro has a gift for delivering terrible stand up. That's completely unfunny. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. <laughs> he's got a knack he's really for good it. at it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, my thoughts are that uh it's the opposite of that trivia thing that i just read it's i think it's this guy completely unable to see himself for what he is and that's the character i don't know what the real life guy was like but the character in this movie it feels like he's about to learn something and then he goes into a monologue from on the waterfront mhm and it feels like that monologue is chosen to maybe shift blame it's a his bit. brother. Yeah. Or yeah, to his brother. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But basically not to himself. I, I think he's he views himself as the Marlon Brando in this situation. That he could have been great. He could have been a contender. Uh instead of a bum, which is what he is. And and although Jake LaMotta in the movie was not a a bum, he's his life didn't turn out the way that he the young Jake LaMotta would have wanted, right? And sure. I think yeah. he's incapable of seeing himself f- for being the villain here. I think he's a, he's he's identifying with this classic Brando monologue uh, in a scene about one guy that was wronged by his brother, and I, I think he identifies with that in all the wrong ways. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Do you think he thinks that his brother actually slept with his wife? Do you think that's a thing he still thinks about? Like- I don't think so, because I think whenever he sees his brother at the end, there's no, maybe, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I think now that she's out of his life, he's just matter. not thinking about it as much anymore. Yeah. I think it was always like whenever they were together, I think it was always like, what is she doing? When is she going to do it? I know she's going to do something. Even if she hasn't already, she's probably going to. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, I think it was just wild insecurity and now that he doesn't really have to like maintain a relationship i don't think he's stressing about it as much and i think in retrospect he's probably like oh yeah that was a dumb thing to be mad about yeah yeah 
Do you think it happened or no? Did no, they slept together? No. Yeah. I don't think so. I think when what, I first what about saw her it, I did. and any of the other people. We'll say that again. What about her and any of the other people, like the people she was with at the club? Because she's, you know, she says like, oh, I I slept with them all. I sucked all their cocks or whatever. Um, she's just tired I think, of being accused I think of she's, it. Yeah, I think she's like, is that what you want to hear? <laughs> yeah, I think she's kind yeah, of telling she, him what he wants to hear. But I'm just curious if you thought. She well, I think she's done. trying to make him make him realize in the moment that there's no right answer to that question. If she says no, he won't believe her. He's like, what do you want to hear? You want to hear that I suck their cocks? And he's like, oh, don't say that. And she's like, well, <laughs> what do you want to hear? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, think it's I just think one he... of those like, what what do you want me to do? I, I I either I did or I didn't. But if I tell you I didn't, this conversation keeps going. And, yeah. and she's in prison, <laughs> you know, like uh, she can't do anything, you know, without being a suspect of some kind, you know, like that performance too, which is kind of a sideline is really good because she just is so sad, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, she, she can't say anything. Even when she, when they're like photographing them by the pool, she tries to say something and he like shuts her up, you know, like, uh, like he doesn't want her to talk. And so I, I don't know. It's this, I, I think she does a really good job. Yeah. It seems like, <laughs> In their relationship, it goes from like the initial scenes where they're first uh, courting each other and they're like kissing really passionately. And he's trying to like pour cold water on himself to get ready for a fight. And she's like trying to tempt him and tease him. And and then it seems like the next step is just her completely defeated and like melancholy the rest of the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm there's even a vibe of. She doesn't have much of a choice whenever he picks her up for the first time, right? Yeah, like, like that's what I was thinking as we were talking about it earlier. Um, this girl didn't ask for this. She was just minding her business at the pool. Hmm. Yeah. I, th- I think it's pretty clear that he gives off the vibe of, like, the kind of guy who's not going to take no for an answer. Right. Um, yeah, it's like, do you want to meet my brother? And it's like, God, how, what an awkward way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, any other thoughts, anybody? No, uh, no further thoughts about Raging Bull, but glad we watched it again. Glad it won. Yeah. 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 It's good to revisit. It's always been one I've been meaning to. I think I've had DVD versions of it over the years that I just never got around to. So there's like three commentaries on the DVD version too. So I'm really? excited to dive three into different those. Scorsese yeah. commentaries. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I don't know yeah. what the other two. I know one of them is Scorsese, but I don't know what the other two are. The, I bet Robert De Niro. Maybe so. I looked at the three on the Criterion, which they all were recorded some time ago. I didn't see anyone that any that were recorded for the four more recently, like for this. Yeah, I know one is. I think Jake LaMotta and the writers yeah, or he something like, like that. Wrote the original or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is like Thelma Shoemaker and I think Scorsese. I can't remember the other one, but it, it sounded interesting too. Yeah. I think it's more like production people, cinematographer or something. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't see if there were any special features. I think they were on a separate disc, though. So that's why yeah, I didn't see any. Yeah, there's a whole other disc, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do we move on? Sure. I'm good to move on. All right. Uh, so let's move on to our Criterion poll. Um, Mike, do you want to tell the people what the theme of the poll is this time? Sure. The theme of the poll this time is going to be noir. So... Noir films within the Criterion Collection. But but why? Uh, do you what know? Do you mean? No. Why, why noir? It? Oh, November noir? Yeah, Noir-vember or whatever noir it is. That they, oh, I, okay. I see. They're doing it on the Criterion channel. I didn't, didn't think we came up with that pun. <laughs> okay. It's a yeah. TCM thing, I think, too. Oh, but, yeah. Well, it's a good one. I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. Yeah, so my name's first on the show notes. Does that mean I get to pick first so you guys sure. don't pick my movie? Okay. Yeah, why not? Sweet. Okay, so I'm looking at Criterion.com for this, and 
I'm going to pick a movie that I saw once in film school that was shown to us, and I thought it was really cool and stylized and neat. Hmm. And I've often thought about it since then, but never really watched it or, you know, attempted to revisit it. So here we go. I'm going with Spy Number 428, a film called Blast of Silence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which came out in 1961. I remember watching that. Yeah. Interesting movie. I liked it. We'll see if yeah. I still do. <laughs> I, I'm, I'd be excited to watch it outside of the setting of class, which yeah. is always makes films a little harder. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Cool, indeed. All right, who's next? Uh, I'm up next, apparently. <laughs> um, so I'm going with... Actually, I'm going I'm to keep on trend with films that I just got the 4K versions of. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd like to watch it. Uh, but that is uh, Jean-Pierre Melville's Le Cercle Rouge. Uh, I was uh, going to yeah. do that, but it's really long. Is I was it? also going to pick that. Is it? It's two hours and 20 minutes. It's not that long. Okay. It's not that long. It's, it's longer like, than my 77-minute blast of silence. That's true. <laughs> Nor should be short. Um it's shorter than Raging Bull, I think. Um, no, Raging Bull's 209. Or, I mean, oh, two hours and nine. Just kidding. I meant Killers of the Flower Moon. It is shorter than sure, that. Sure, everything's like, shorter than that. like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But yeah, I've, I'm, I've seen this movie once, and I remember not a thing about it other yeah, like than it. liking it and enjoying it, um, as I tend to do Melville movies. So, yeah, 4K version. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, it's a good movie. All right. Chris? I am also going to go with Jean-Pierre Melville. Uh, uh oh. I knew my, it. My movie. Uh, I was actually going to pick uh, Circle Rouge, um, but this one's better than that. And it's Le Samurai. Um, I really love this movie. Um, I, went I know to, like, you a- do. You actually forced the DVD onto me. That was, I think, the first <laughs> criterion that you forced onto me. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Um, it's very Jake LaMotta of you. You never give him a choice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, the whole time, You're like, I was hey, you like, want to watch this movie? And I was like, yeah. all right. I was chanting to myself, I'm the boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> there was no question mark. It wasn't, hey, you want to watch this movie? It was, hey, hey you, you want to watch, watch this, this movie? movie. <laughs> you want to watch this movie? Yeah. yeah. Definitive. Uh, I also like really like Elaine Delon in this uh, film. Um, I think he's really good. Man, and this is like, I, I don't remember there being a lot of like style, like camera wise, like more Scorsese editing, but there is some style, like just the way the characters look. Um, they just look cool, and I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I I'm looking forward to it. It's an incredibly cool movie. Yeah, I, yeah. I could see like Clint Eastwood playing this role uh, easily. It's kind of like uh, it reminds me of Drive in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Does he talk in this movie? It's been so long since I've seen the Sam. I think barely. I, yeah. yeah. I don't think much, but I, I also don't remember too much about this one. Um, but yeah, I've seen all three of these, and I think I've seen yeah. all three of these one time, exactly. And a long time ago at that. Yeah, so <laughs> any rewatch of any of these will be great. Yeah, we're Absolutely. all going to be winners here. Unlike okay. Jake LaMotta. Yeah, yeah. so... Go to our Twitter slash X account at Casual Cinecast and vote. And with that, I think we're done with the episode, right? We are. Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you so much, listener, for listening. As always, thanks, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, go to SoundCloud.com slash Bob Scotch. All right. Stay tuned to this channel. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, yeah. What is our next episode going to be? Oh, man. You know what we should really do? If 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 it's still playing, we should do The Killing. Because if... Like, I well, tried Samurai to get you to wins. see that with me this weekend. Uh, well, last the, weekend. I, uh, this weekend... The what? Uh, what? The Killing? Yeah, the, killer. the new David Fincher movie. Oh, David Fincher, killer. Michael Fassbender. Oh, did I, I say The, the Killing? I think you said The Killing, and I was like, the Stanley Kubrick movie? Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. a Criterion one, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, the Killer, Anyways, yeah. We'll, we'll see... The uh, Anatomy of Fall also came out too, uh, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, TBD then. Our favorite. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Love it. Cool. All right, guys. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Texas Rangers are the World Series champions. <sighs> Thank you Who? very much. 
Uh, I'm ignoring that just now. Uh, all right. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. I'm going to do a scene from the movie Raging Bull. You fucked my wife? What? You fucked my wife? How can you ask me a question like that? How can you ask me? I'm your brother and you ask me that? Where do you get the balls big enough to ask me that?